Another quick just round of applause for Rick and all the sponsors and then John and his presentation here. So you guys can submit questions, like John said, um, throughout the talk whenever you want to. I'm, I'll, just in the interest of time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through the presentation and then address the questions at the end. But please, as you think of them, submit them, and then I'll be able to see them up here. So your future mobile strategy, what mobile means now. That's the topic for today. Like Darren said, my name is Mike Ballinger. I'm available on Twitter, at Mike Ballinger. I lead the team at Livefront. We design and build mobile software. So companies hire us to help them take an idea, design it, program it, and put it in the app store so that, that their customers, their users, can download an apps for phones and tablets and watches. And I co-founded Tech.MN. We are a media group of sorts, news about what's happening in Minnesota technology with an emphasis on the startup culture. So your future mobile strategy, what mobile means now. I wanted to put this talk together because recently I've changed the way that I think about mobile software, and I thought it'd be kind of fun to try and convince you that you should too. So I'll start with a couple examples as to kind of why I came into this thinking. Uh, I use a, an application, a mobile app, called Wonderlist. And it's a to-do list application. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of them out there, right? I like Wonderlist. I use it on my computer. I use it on my phone. And I write down things I need to remember. Makes sense. But what I've found and what I realized recently is those moments in which I need to remember something, right, or I want to write something down, are not the moments that I'm really predisposed to actually look at my phone or look at the screen, right? I'm driving. I sh I'm not on my phone. But when I'm driving and decompressing after work is when I remember something that I need to do, or I need to be reminded to stop somewhere on the way home. That's example number one. Example number two, I use Evernote. I'm sure many people in this room do. It's a note-taking app. And I can write down different ideas and inspiration for my next talk, whatever it is. But those moments in which I'm inspired, or I think of something really great that I need to write down, are not those moments when I'm necessarily using my phone, right? And I can download content and movies as a third example from iTunes and, and different apps there. It looks like we just lost screen. Oh, all right. Uh, but those moments when uh, I really want to do something related to movies, as an example, is uh, flying home from an international flight, watching a movie. It gets cut off 10 minutes early because the plane landed early, right? And you miss that last 10 minutes, the best part. And final example, I can use the Target app, and I do use the Target app with uh, my wife, and we can make a list for our next Target run, and we share that list, and it's great. Paper towels and, and toilet paper, whatever it is. But the, uh, the moments in which I remember, oh yeah, we need paper towels, are not always the moments I'm cuddled up on the couch uh, using my Target app, <laughs> right? Uh, it's more like this. This is, this is like what my house looks like. Does this look familiar in the mornings? I don't even have kids. This is getting my wife out the door. <laughs> but a, a couple of things about, the, about these, these, these examples. Number one is I really want to use these services and these apps, right? I want to use Evernote. I want to use Target. I like, I like these services. I like these brands. Uh, but number two, in all of these examples, I am in one way or another in motion. I am moving. I am trying to get home from work, I'm trying to get to work, I'm trying to get out the door, I'm coming home from a trip, whatever it is, right? And so in all these situations, it's not so much about the device, it's not so much about my phone, it's more about the motion, and it's more about that movement, and it's more about a lifestyle. So I kind of came to this realization that we should be thinking about mobile as not so much a device, but mobile as a lifestyle. And, and uh, because mobile is that lifestyle of being in motion. And the best mobile software, the best mobile apps, the best mobile websites are going to be those apps and sites that meet the demands of that mobile lifestyle, regardless of who I am, regardless of what my motivations are, regardless of what environment I'm in, what space I'm in, my location, right? Regardless of what device I have or don't have, for that matter. And regardless of what features or functionality or services that I need or want to use. And so often, our organizations, our companies, all of us, think about mobile strategy from a very device-centric standpoint. 
You know, do you have a mobile strategy? Oh yeah, we've got an iPhone app, right? Or an Android app is coming next month, right? Uh, and when we talk about mobile, we say mobile software for people using smart devices. Our definition of mobile strategy, mobile software for people using smart devices. And that's adequate, I mean it's not incorrect, right? It's certainly where we started, but I would say it doesn't go far enough. And if we move some things around and shift a few words around, I think we get to a better spot. So what if instead of mobile software for people who are using smart devices, we defined it as smart software for people who are mobile? And it's a very subtle difference, but I think it means a lot. And you'll notice the word devices falls off completely because devices are important, right? It's a, but they're just a part of the overall equation. And you move from this idea, when you think about it that way, from the, that devices are mobile to this idea that people are mobile. And another way that I like to think about this is we at Livefront like to help companies create software that matters for people in motion. And that is more exciting than just creating an iPhone app, right? Because you're doing something bigger. You're solving real business problems. You're adding real business value to people's lives as they're moving about and running to and fro like we all do frantically. So that's what I want to do. I want to create software that matters for people in motion. Uh, and in some ways, that's kind of the, the uh, two minutes in, the conclusion of my presentation, right? It's, it's this is what I want to get to. So for the rest of the time, I want to do two things. Number one, I'll spend a lot of time talking about what is shifting. What are trends that are happening right now in mobile that we as business people, business owners, executives, entrepreneurs, product managers, marketers, whatever the role, can think of, uh, need to know about that, uh, in, in the industry and as, as it relates to what's happening in mobile. So 20 trends. And then, what do we do about it? Four high level ideas, insights, whatever, for uh, how we can push these ideas forward in our organization as we think about what we're actually gonna do. So 20 trends. Um, I'm going to divide these trends into four or five groups of trends. We'll call them movements, so they sound more important than they are. Uh, movement number one is the digitization of everything. So trend number one inside that first movement is the growth of connected devices. Gartner talks about how there'll be 30 billion connected phones and tablets and devices uh, by the end of 2020, and that's up from 2.5 billion just in 2009. So incredible growth there. Trend number two, growth of connected sensors. Cisco says there'll be 50 billion connected devices and sensors. So when they say sensors, they mean like, you know, all the other stuff connected, cameras and thermostats and all of, uh, all, all of that kind of stuff. So Cisco says 50 billion. IBM disagrees. They say one trillion devices uh, by the end of next year. And I say, hey, as long as we're making up random large numbers, there'll be 1,000 quadrillion zillion devices uh, just tomorrow. So, by the way, uh, John did that quick survey, how many devices you have, is it like five to seven was kind of the biggest one. If everyone has one trillion devices and sensors, that means every single person in the world has 100 devices or sensors connected to the internet, um, which I don't think we're quite there yet. At least I know personally I don't have that, so. Trend number three, growth of connected households. 800 million households will be connected to the internet by the end of this year in the world. That's up from uh, 400 million approximately just a couple years ago in 2012. So enormous growth there, which means 42% of every household, 42% uh, of households in the entire world will be connected by the end of this year. And then trend number four is the growth of connected lifestyles, which is really kind of an outcome of trend one, two, and three. You've seen some of these stats, maybe. Uh, Kleiner Perkins talks about how their research shows that 150, uh, people check their phones 150 times per day, pulling it out of the pocket, checking the time, texting, whatever it is. 68% of people check their phones within 15 minutes of waking up. 87% of millennials have their phone on them day and night. And one in three people get anxious if they don't have their phone on them. One in three people getting. It's actually important to note that two or three people think that's ridiculous. <laughs> there's no, there's no reason, no reason to be anxious. So that's the first movement: digitization of everything. Second movement is the normalization of inattention. 
So trend number five, inattention is becoming standard. Basically, no one's paying attention anymore. Google talks about this idea of uh, people paying attention in bursts of time, not sessions of time. They share a couple stats. Again, this is Google uh, research. 20% over the last year, 20% increase in mobile share of online sessions and sites and apps. And at the same time, an 18% decrease in the time spent per visit. So you can see people are, are going and using mobile more often, but in shorter periods of time. So they're not engaging for long sessions, doing it a lot, but for, for a less amount of time. And some people might say, well, maybe they're going to their phone and looking for something and not finding it. That's not true because at the exact same time, Google says they saw uh, across the board 29% increase in conversions on mobile during that exact same time period. So trend number five is inattention. Trend number six is interruption. This can kind of go both ways. It's good because uh, people can be distracted from something else into using your app or site, but bad because the opposite can happen too. They'll be distracted away from using it. Uh, again, some more Google stats. 91% of people turn to their phone in the middle of doing some other task. They interrupt or intentionally go to their phone to get inspiration or ideas for what they're working on. But 29% of people immediately go from a, a mobile site or a mobile app if, if it doesn't give them what they want right away. Uh, so trend number seven is just that. Immediacy is demanded. Speed is demanded. We want things faster, turns out. Research shows we're not patient, uh, and we're making decisions faster. 68% of, uh, sorry, 60% of people make purchase decisions more quickly now than they did a year ago. And then we already talked about how 29% of people immediately go to a different app, and a lot of those go because, frankly, the site or the app is too slow, or there's too many steps in the process, the navigation is too hard, or whatever it is, they can't find what they're looking for. It's too frustrating. So that's the second movement. The first movement was digitization of everything. Second movement is normalization of inattention. I'm talking fast because I want to make sure we get through all the movements. Uh, but uh, if you guys have, uh, I'm, I'm happy to stick around afterwards even beyond if you, if you want to talk more about any of these. Movement number three is divorcing interfaces from devices. This is actually one of my favorites. We um, now look at our screens. Right for almost everything, but more and more we're seeing additional methods of input instead of just tapping on glass, instead of just looking at the screen. We're seeing more methods of input, we're looking, seeing more methods of output. And the first, what I call trend number eight, is voice as an interface. And you see this now, uh, I've seen this in the last couple months even, uh, where you know, if you're using hand gestures as you speak, you might say, oh hey, I'm gonna go text my spouse. Right, I just gotta text her real quick. But now, I see people, instead of using their thumbs, pretending they're typing when they say that, they're saying, oh hey, I'm gonna need to go text my spouse. Because what they're gonna do is speak into the microphone the message they're texting, because why bother typing when you could just talk it out really quickly? Voice recognition and, and uh, parsing and, uh, has gotten to the point where it's actually useful instead of frustrating. And so voice as an interface is a, is a huge trend. And one of the things it means is that we're no longer necessarily constrained by the location of the device. And so that opens up a whole new line and uh, possibilities in, in, in products. How many are you familiar with the Amazon Echo? So quite a few. There, uh, for those of you that don't know, it's basically this cylinder that's 18 inches tall, pretty small uh, radius, and it sits in your kitchen or your living room and you can talk to it and you can ask it questions. Um, and, and it can talk back to you. So one, one crude example, uh, it's sitting in my kitchen at home. If I'm making cookies, which of course I do often, uh, I can have my hands in the batter, right? And uh, if I needed to know how many teaspoons are in a tablespoon, the, the, the old method is clean off, get my hands out of the batter, clean my hands, go get the iPad, put it somewhere where I'm not gonna spill flour on it, just go to Google, look up how many teaspoons are in a tablespoon, go back into the batter. Now, hands in the batter, I say Alexa, which is how you address the Amazon Echo to get its attention. Alexa, how many teaspoons are in a tablespoon? And she tells me. Meanwhile, and I just go on. And she gives me the right answer even. So that, that's pretty brilliant. That's a huge fundamental shift in how we interact with software. And it actually works great. 
Trend number nine, so trend number eight is voice as an interface, trend number nine is vision as an interface. And I don't mean us looking at a screen because we've been doing that for a long time. I mean the screen or the device or the application looking at us, um, which has a few interesting implications. And you're just starting to see some of this, but here's a proof of concept of a automobile dashboard where someone is gesturing in order to control the power of the radio or the volume of the radio or whatever they might need to do. And you'll notice that the gesture itself is larger than the screen. And the point of that is you're driving, you don't want to be distracted trying to find that little button. So if you could use gestures with your hands, you can use that as a mechanism of input without having to focus on that finite motor movement and take your eyes off the road. Trend number 10, haptics or touch as an interface. And again, that relates to both input, which we've been doing for a long time, touching a screen, but also that device or that application touching you. I think it's really interesting that one of my favorite applications of the Apple Watch is that, let's say after, after this, we decide to go grab a cup of coffee. You and I are walking down the street. I had entered an address for where we're going because we don't know exactly where it is. Instead of looking at the screen all the time to see which way I'm supposed to turn, or instead of listening all the time to my phone or whatever for it to tell me turn left or turn right, it'll buzz on my wrist. It'll buzz a little bit differently to tell me when to turn left and a little bit differently to tell me when to turn right. So I can actually be engaged with you socially and we aren't interrupted by the technology, we're assisted by the technology because it's not using, I'm not looking at the screen, it's touching me. Whole new, whole new way to interact with software. Trend number 11, I'll breeze through some of these quickly, sensors. Basically this idea, your phone has a lot of sensors, yes, you know, has a camera and it has a microphone but there's a bunch of external sensors, your thermostat and your cameras and your smoke detectors that can now interface with your phone to augment its abilities and its capabilities. Trend number 12, systems as an interface, you're seeing more and more companies uh, that are friendly competitors or just in different markets altogether combine to join forces to create capabilities that wouldn't otherwise exist. Um, so you're no longer constrained by the scope of a single company's product or service. One example with Amazon Alexa, I can have that Amazon Alexa, which is an Amazon product, control my Nest thermostat, which is a Google product. They, those companies are not related to each other other than being competitors in some areas, but as a consumer, I'm able to benefit from the fact that their systems have integrated. And trend number 13, automation and artificial intelligence as an interface. This could be a whole, whole topic, but uh, Forbes talks about how artificial intelligence is the new user interface. And essentially, you're starting to see expert systems creep into our everyday lives in a way that's pretty, pretty beneficial uh, most of the time, at least thus far. Uh, you see this a lot with iOS 9 and Siri and also Google Now. So as an example with Google, Google Now on tap, you can, it can read your mess, it can read your calendar, it can read the traffic, it knows where you work. So it can tell you without you asking it, hey Mike, you should leave seven minutes earlier today because there's an accident on your normal route and I know you have a 9 a.m. meeting. So I didn't ask it anything, right? It just proactively told me what to do, which is a, is a mechanism of interacting with software. So you're gonna see a lot more of that. So that's the third movement, divorcing interfaces from devices. So we had digitization of everything, normalization of inattention, number two, and number three, divorcing interfaces from devices. Number four, shifts in consumer expectations. So trend number 14 of 20 is changing cultural values and needs. Kleiner Perkins talks about how, I think it's 14 to 24 year olds are basically controlling the trends of, of everything in technology in terms of what's being done, how, how much stuff is used, what's popular, right? And that's kind of true for everything. So rest assured, we're in really good hands. <laughs> uh, but three things to understand. Number one, uh, especially for this generation and more and more uh, you know, a, a surplus of the, the, the population is always on, always visual, and always seeking out experiences. So always on, a few stats from Kleiner Perkins. Um, this, for those of you who can't see, mobile device never leaves my side. 87% of people uh, of that generation say the mobile device never leaves their side. First thing I do is reach for my mobile device in the morning, 80%. 
I spend more than two hours every day looking at the screen on my mobile device and using it, 78%. And in the next five years, every single thing I do will be with my mobile phone, 60%. So does, your mo does mobile strategy matter? I think probably. <laughs> always on, so always visual too. Um, it's a very visual generation. So one interesting measure of this is just to kind of look at the uh, one proxy for measuring this, I should say, is looking at the growth of some of the most popular social networks over the last year. Facebook uh, was down a little bit in terms of its growth. Instagram was up, it's more visual, right? It's strictly images. Snapchat was up. Twitter, which was a little less visual at its core anyway, was down. And Pinterest, which is a visual thing by default, it was up. So always visual and then always seeking experiences. The, um, I think it's the Harris group did some research. They said this generation not only highly values experiences, but they are increasingly spending time and money on them from concerts to artistic events, um, cultural experiences. For this group, happiness isn't as focused on possessions or career status, but rather on creating and sharing and capturing memories earned through experiences that can be shared. And then Fast Company summed it up well for what that actually means, which is a product or service is powerful because of how it connects people to something or someone else. And has impact because we can do something worthwhile with it, or it tells something others about us. It has something to say about us. So this idea that experiences matter to this generation. Trend number 15, expectations of excellence. Accenture uh, has the Fjord Design Center that does a lot of research. They had a, this, this great insight and they call this uh, liquid expectations. And the idea is this, you no longer, uh, it used to be that you would walk into uh, Wells Fargo and you would compare that experience with walking into US Bank. Uh, and y your level of service, how it felt when you walked in, et cetera, et cetera. But in the digital age, when you use the Wells Fargo app, and I don't mean to necessarily pick on Wells Fargo, but when you use the Wells Fargo app, you're not comparing it to the US Bank app necessarily. You're comparing it to every other digital app experience you've had. That's kind of bad news for Wells Fargo or US Bank or any large organization especially because there are really well-funded, really driven, passionate startups that, are in, that really believe in, in uh, design and user experience and providing a really core experience that is mobile is the only thing they do, right? So I'm not, as a consumer, comparing my Wells Fargo app to US Bank, I'm comparing my Wells Fargo app to my experience with the Uber app, right? Or my experience with the Apple Music app. Does it one thing, does it really well, super beautifully designed, great user experience. And so it's kind of, we're in a world of these quote unquote unfair comparisons where consumers are not looking at that physical space like they used to. It's the digital experience, but hey, if Uber can do it so easily, why can't Wells Fargo, et cetera, et cetera. And then related to that, expectations of excellence is trend number 16, expectations of speed. And that's, what, I, that's actually what we, we talked about earlier, so I'll skip over it. We, basically, I want it now, right? We want things fast especially when it comes to technology, we're not, we're not waiting around. So that's shifts in consumer expectations, movement number four. Movement number five is the evolution of how services and content are consumed and delivered by, by consumers. So trend number 17, experiences are increasingly cross-device. 90% of people use multiple screens for everyday activities. I talked about Evernote before. I use Evernote on my, uh, on my laptop, I use it on my tablet, I use it on my phone every day. Just depends on if I'm on my, you know, in between meetings or I'm sitting at my desk, whatever it is, I'm using it across multiple devices. 40% of people research on the phone and then go purchase on the desktop. And a lot of retailers haven't figured out how to measure this yet, so they're incorrectly attributing desktop sales to their desktop website to, uh, to, to the desktop instead of mobile. Whereas, because as an example, if I'm waiting around for a meeting to start, I might be on my phone looking at that, that thing on Target or looking at health plans on whatever, right, for, uh, for my family. I'm not gonna purchase it right then and there because I'm gonna go home and talk to my spouse and then, you know, we're sitting around after dinner or whatever on the laptops, that's when we purchase. 
But if you hadn't, if that brand, that healthcare brand or that retail brand hadn't been present on mobile and I couldn't have interacted with it and done that browsing while I was waiting in the meeting, then I wouldn't have gone to the desktop site later that night. So this is why Forrester said that this year and next year, most companies are going to underinvest significantly in mobile because they don't know how to measure its impact yet. So trend number eight, uh, 18, experiences are increasingly cross-channel. So people are moving seamlessly across both devices, like I just talked about, but also channels in route to conversion. And by channels, I mean it might be the digital channel and it might be a physical channel. So Target saw a 3.2 uh, X, more 3.2 times more sales from people who were using the app while they shopped in the physical store than people who were just shopping in the physical store without the app. So that digital experience augmented that experience in the store in a positive way such that it ended up in a larger cart purchase at the end. Trend number 19, experiences are increasingly once removed. So the best companies are figuring out that how to reduce that time between an intention an action at the moment of interest or that moment of desire. So when your consumers, when your users want something, the, the, the best thing to do is to make sure that you're the fastest one to provide it to them. The problem is that moment of desire, that moment of intention may not coincide with the use of the app. So I'll give you a quick example. This is a Pinterest app. I can search for jacket, right? Pulls up jacket, of course I'm interested in this tweed blazer because it's awesome. I can click on that, I see the detail. Instead of just pinning it to my board like I could in Pinterest, or my wife could in Pinterest, I can also buy it. When I click buy it, I'm not taking, I swear that's not part of my presentation, that it keeps doing this. Uh, when I click buy it, I don't get brought out to the, um, the Macy's mobile app. I don't get brought out to the Macy's mobile website. I buy it right inside this Pinterest app. And then I buy it and continue on my way. I didn't get taken out, but you'll notice it's sold by Macy's. So I didn't go to the Macy's site, I didn't go to the Macy's app, but I did just buy something from Macy's. That's pretty significant. And that's e-commerce, what I call once removed. And you see this uh, being experimented with in different ways, right? I don't, this hasn't been figured out uh, to be f fully effective yet, but you see it on Twitter, you see it uh, in Facebook, in chatting, you can buy things. And then finally, trend number 20, and I'll, I'll breeze through this one because this could also be a whole separate presentation, is immersion technology is reading the point of usefulness. And I call immersion technology anything that kind of surrounds us um, and creates new channels of technology. And that's uh, virtual reality, or an augmented reality, right? Uh, we're seeing a lot happening in the home automation space where that's not just professional installations on mansions anymore. It's consumer level, but reliable enough to actually be useful. Um, wearables and embedded devices are huge, especially in health and wellness. Uh, and then automobiles are going to change a lot in the next five to 10 years. So all of these things are also trends to be looking at kind of separately. So that's the evolution of service and content delivery. So to recap, the five movements, digitization of everything, normalization of inattention, divorcing interfaces from devices, evolution, uh, or sorry, shifts in consumer expectations, and then the changes in how uh, services and content are delivered. So that's 20 trends. And I do not have a voice. <laughs> uh, so next, I want to talk about what to do about it. High level ideas, four ideas, four insights. And I'll talk about each one of these um, for just a couple minutes. The first is build systems, not destinations. The second is think about moments, not sessions. The third is build products, products, not projects. And the fourth is create value, not spin. So systems, not destinations. Uh, the, probably the biggest key, in my opinion, to building uh, a, a future mobile strategy that's going to work is, is thinking about uh, how you're going to get closer to your user, to your customer, to your client through mobile at that, and get closer to them sooner at that moment of desire when they want to interact with you. And I use uh, this Macy's example, right? 
Macy's has, a, and when I talk about destinations, right, Macy's has a destination website, macy's.com. It's really good, they do a lot of sales through it, right? Macy's has a destination mobile app. It's really good, they do a lot of sales from it, right? But they also, they, they built those destinations using a collection of systems, a collection of functionality, such that they could also do, in addition to those destinations, which are and will remain important, other things like partner with Pinterest and allow people to buy through third parties and other inter systems integrations. Because increasingly, as we saw in the trends, people, consumers expect things to work across devices, right, across channels, one, in once removed scenarios, and there's not gonna be a single interface, it's not just vision anymore, right? And this whole idea is called atomization, breaking up destinations into tiny little pieces so that you can assemble them in whatever way you want to, to deliver to your customers, to your users, in whatever configuration that they actually want and need. So to go back to an example from the beginning with Delta, right? They have this in-flight entertainment system and it works really great. Uh, it's a destination from a, from a technology perspective. It's a destination. What if they thought about it as a system? What if you guys have seen the tablets that are in the, the airport? You can go like order food from them and they're on all the waiting areas. What if on that, if my flight's delayed, I could start a movie here. When I get on the plane, I could continue it in the in-flight system. And if I land early, I could open up the Delta app on my phone while I'm at baggage claim and finish that last 10 minutes. That's the kind of thing you can do when you think about systems, when you think about destinations. And all of these are right now individual destinations. They're all really good to serve their own purpose, but they don't work together. There are three separate destinations, and I bet Delta's so large that these guys might not even know each other, <laughs> all the people leading these. When you think about systems, though, then it makes possible that sort of continuity between all of those destinations. Because when you think about destinations, you think, how can I drive more traffic, more views, more use to our website and our app? When you think about systems, you think a little bit differently, and I think more importantly about how you can design and engineer features and content to maximize the exposure, maximize the value to users. Um, and so four, four tips on doing that. One, break everything apart. We just talked about that, that atomization concept. You break your larger systems into smaller systems so you can combine them in new ways. You think beyond tapping on glass, right? Another example from the beginning. In this, in this scenario with my head on the table trying to get um, wife and kids out the door, I'm not going to take out my phone and order paper towels um, from that Target app. I'm not gonna take out my phone and tap on glass and order paper towels from Amazon, but I might, with my head on the table, say, hey Alexa, order me paper towels. Because I don't have to do anything and Alexa just hears me because I have the Amazon Echo sitting in my kitchen. So I didn't use my app to order from Target, I didn't use my app to order from Amazon, but I did just order from Amazon. Because they figured out how to meet me in that moment and get closer to that moment of desire in a, can, a way that's convenient for me. So that's building systems, not destinations. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'll skip over uh, three and four, but we can loop back to that if we have if we have some chance uh, have a chance. So build systems, not destinations. The first idea. The second idea is think in moments, not sessions. And Google and uh, Forrester have coined this term called micro moments, and they're exactly what they sound like, small moments of time, right, where you're doing something or engaged with something, uh, or you want something. You might be uh, standing in line at the ATM and um, shooting off a quick work email. You might be sending a, a, a text message to your spouse about a carpool. You might be uh, standing in an aisle at a big box retailer comparing the price of the TV in front of you to what's online, right? And in some of those moments, some of those micro moments, you might be open to or willing to receiving some sort of engagement from that brand or some other service, right? And some of them you're not. If you try and give me an ad while I'm texting my wife, I'm gonna ignore it completely. I don't want to see that at all. But if I'm standing in Best Buy and I'm looking at a TV and uh, I'm on my phone and you give me an ad for 20% off the TV I'm looking at, that's more interesting. I might, as a consumer, engage with that, right? And so 
Google talks about the, there being four different moments that brands, that companies need to understand that their consumers are gonna be in at any given time when they might wanna engage. I want to know moments, I wanna know something. I want to go moments, I wanna go somewhere. I want to do something or, or learn something, they would say. And I want to buy something. I know I want to buy this, I just wanna get it done as quickly as possible. And for companies to be successful in quote unquote converting in those moments, they need to first be there, they need to be present, they need to have a mobile strategy in the first place, right? Uh, number two, with that strategy, they need to be useful. It can't just be spamming, it can't just be advertising, it can't just be hitting you over the head, you have to, they have to add value. And then number three, they have to be quick about it. They have to do it quickly and serve the customer fast. So I like to make this little matrix. Um, it's gonna be really hard to see in the back, but a grid with the type of moments I want to buy, go, do, whatever. On the left-hand side and across the top, be there, be useful, and be quick. And then think about for your company, your organization, in these moments, are you these things? And that can help you really define, you know what, oh yeah, maybe we could do a better job in these moments. As one example, Home Depot. They know that uh, a lot of males my age will, uh, around the house, use their phone to look up how to blank. How do you fix the toilet, right? And they look, look this up a lot, it turns out. So what did they do? They created oh, at least 100, it might be more, 100 videos branded Home Depot, right? on how to blank, how to fix the toilet, how to clean out the gutters, whatever, whatever, right? And so that made them, in that moment when I want to do something or I want to learn something, they as a brand, as a company, were there and they were useful and they were the first search result, right? And they've had over 70 million views of these videos. And so if I've gotta go get a different uh, handle for the toilet to fix it, I, that doesn't, this doesn't guarantee I'm gonna go to Home Depot, but it certainly brings it top of mind and there's a Home Depot right down the street, right? That's the strategy. Um, as another example, if I'm, uh, from the beginning, if I'm working on the to-do list app, if I was Wonderlist, if I owned that company and I was in charge of product strategy, I would be thinking not just what does version two look like for the phone, because that's important, but also, how do we integrate with car manufacturers and systems so that people can be reminded in a really intelligent and safe way of things on their to-do list as they're driving past the dry cleaners and Bozo Mike forgets to pick up the dry cleaning. So that's moments, not sessions, that's number two. Number three, products, not projects. Uh, our friends at GoCart, which is a, a marketing and strategy firm here uh, locally, talk about this idea. With projects, you think our executives happy, our sponsors happy, are we meeting requirements, are we meeting timeline, budget. With products, you think a little bit differently. You think, are our users happy? Are we creating engagement and delight and therefore sales? Because projects end and products endure, right? You manage projects and you manage products to endure. And really great products, really great mobile apps, really great sites, you can't just start ignoring them because the best products solve a need and then they anticipate the next need. That's how you engage in a genuine way with your consumers. And you can't anticipate the next need that your, your, your consumers, your users want if you ended your project back in July, right? You're not paying attention to it anymore. So you've got to think more long term when you're putting these things together. And then finally, uh, create value not spin. So you can no longer hide behind your brand. So many companies have built up a really great brand and then they kind of want to just shove products and services down the throat of, of consumers when, and, and kind of think of their digital experience as a last resort or a second thought. Um, but it turns out more and more, especially people are more loyal to their need, their desire in that, those micro moments, I want to know, I want to go, I want to buy than they are to any particular brand. In fact, Google says uh, their research shows that 51% of people purchased from a brand other than the one they intended to because the information provided in that site or that app or whatever was more useful from that other brand. So that's pretty significant. You can't add, you can't build loyalty until you're there, you're useful, and you're quick about it. 
It's not, it, it's not the opposite way around, right? Your digital experience is your brand. Your brand doesn't drive your digital experience. So when you're thinking about spinning, right, it's how can we sell our more clearly defined product more profitably? When you're thinking about adding value, it's how can we improve our customers' lives while they're on the go? And that is, after all, how do we create software that matters to people in motion? And that's the conclusion we started with. So I think we're out of time. But thank you very much for listening and taking part. So uh, one question, um, how far are we from the end of the need for devices? For example, your smartphone visible on your arm. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is a, I'm not sure who, who sent this one in, but the, the, how, essentially the question is how far away are we from like basically not carrying around phones at all? Uh, I, think, I think we'll have phones and devices for quite a while. They'll change in form, factor, and feature, and function, right? But um, more and more, the, the, you're going to see services and software and ways to interact with that service and software, kind of per my presentation, um, kind of fade into the background. Like, it's just there. With, with Amazon Echo in my kitchen, I can just ask out of nowhere questions about the weather and traffic and measurements and conversions and president's birthdays and sports scores. And there's just an answer waiting. And for us, that's always gonna be kind of novel, but for someone that's born today, they're gonna grow up in this world where internet connectivity and data and intelligence, quote unquote, is just normal. That's life, it's part of the infrastructure. It's as normal as we're, we don't think of water, turning on the water. It, we, we don't think about that. We just assume it's gonna be there in 99.9999% in Minnesota. It is, if not more than that, right? In the US. So we don't think about it at all. Now we still kind of think, oh yeah, the Wi-Fi is down or the internet's slow or I can't find what I'm looking for. That will stop. That will fade into the background and that could be scary. Could be really cool. Uh, but that is what will happen. It, it, it's not going to be so front of mind for us. And I think that has huge implications for that question about the device is so much of our interactions will be with, with not just our phone, but with everything that is connected to the internet and every single thing will be connected to the internet. Uh, we, I can look here or if there's, um, uh, I, how can people be making more, making purchase decisions more quickly than before? when I hear people are investigating many websites before purchases? Um, I think, so I, I don't know the exact answer to this, but the, um, people are making purchase decisions more quickly than before because that information is available to them to compare. So I would venture to say, my hypothesis is, People were still looking at multiple options in the past, but now I can look at multiple options in, for purchasing and, and delivery and shipping costs to buy a new drill in a matter of seconds using Google. Whereas before I'd have to drive, go to Menards, go to Home Depot, whatever. And so I'm just able to make more informed, intelligent decisions and have it cost the same or less than it did before, so I'm making that purchase quicker. Any other questions as I, as I read through this? Yeah, let me read, let me read through these for a second. Um, relating to digitizations, seems like households is an obsolete metric. Won't the explosion of business use and the internet of things be a greater impact? Uh, yes, so in that, in that first movement of digitization of everything, I talked about how there's a you know, uh, crazy number of connected devices, right? C even crazier number of connected sensors, and then I talked thirdly about how there's increasing number of connected households. I think Businesses being connected is a stat I didn't talk about, but obviously that's increasing over time. 
And it's really about the individual being connected and having the capability and the service and the data connectivity, regardless of how that happens. And you're going to see, especially in developing countries, uh, just as we, there, many countries uh, uh, skipped over landline telephones. There just never was a thing as dial-up internet. There never was a thing as landline. They went from nothing to cell phones. And you're going to see this sort of continued jumps and leaps and hurdles in technology in places that uh, forerunners in the tech sphere in Europe and, and here in the US in terms of um, technology, only the best of those worlds will be adopted in those, in those other countries as they catch up. Now that has some other ramifications, um, both good and bad from a cultural and commercial perspective um, uh, when you kind of skip over things like that, but, but that is the reality. And it really does come down to just ubiquitous access to the internet and everything it empowers.